I want to welcome those who are joining us via the BoxCast um, platform. Uh, some friends of mine are joining us from India and also from Nepal. Those of you who are watching in the Caribbean and also our family here in the States, we are happy to have all of you joining us today. I want to thank the worship and music team for the fantastic job done this morning leading us into the presence of the Holy Spirit. As I looked, I saw a young lad hitting the drums. I also put our hands together for the worship team and for that young man who braved it. Very good job, son. God is good. And all the time, I'm glad you got it. Because God is good. And so as we say, especially today. We thank God for his grace, and we thank God for his mercies towards us. It's been a blessing to connect with the family of God here, and to discern what God would want to speak to us in this season. I believe it is safe to say that for all of us, this year has been an unusual one, one like no other. You've been dealing with uncertainty, the uncertainty of the current situation. You may have had to cancel plans. For some, you've had to deal with financial challenges brought on by the downturn in the economy and the anxiety that this reality brings on for many. In the midst of all of this, we've been asked to practice something that goes against our very nature. We've been asked to practice social and physical distancing. Even that is problematic. You're unsure how to greet someone when you meet them. <laughs> Should I shake hands? Should I touch elbows or fists? Or just give a wave. And sometimes that can become a little uncomfortable. And you may just have to discreetly sanitize your hands without offending anyone. Some of you have not been able to visit close family members in usual ways. Have to say hello from a distance. Many churches have had to cancel activities that bring people together to connect at a deep and personal level. Church clinics, church picnics, small group meetings are among the casualties of the pandemic. We are not made for social and physical distancing, but we appreciate the need to be responsible and to be careful. This morning I heard one of the worship leaders say, we're looking forward to that hug. We, we, we miss out on that touch. I believe the psychologist would tell us that we need a certain number of, of hugs and touches. And we, this, this pandemic has, has caused us to miss out on that personal touch. Some of you may have family members that you can hug. But for some there are family members that you may have to say hello to at a distance. A difficult and challenging season for many. Some of you may be experiencing loneliness, fear, depression, and discouragement. And don't feel the freedom to even talk about it. I don't want persons to think that I'm being fearful. I don't want persons to think that I'm being anxious. You may feel depression. You may face discouragement. How do we maintain the spiritual and emotional well-being amid this pandemic? How can we overcome the limitations of this period and strengthen the church's communal life amid the pandemic? Today, I invite you here as a family to take a short journey with Epaphras. 
In the book of Colossians, as the Apostle Paul closes his letter, he writes a greeting and a benediction. I want us to zoom in on chapter 4 and verse 12, where he sends greetings to the church on behalf of Epaphras. He writes, Epaphras who is one of you, a bond servant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Epaphras is one of you, he says. I would like the church to say the name Epaphras. Say it again. The next time you hear that name, I want you to remember what we will talk about this morning. But doesn't that name sound like a wonderful name for an American boy? <laughs> the name probably means lovely, but I don't think the young lad will quite be enamored with that. We come across the name Epaphras three times in the New Testament. Twice here in the book of Colossians, and once in the book of Philemon. Epaphras had been a key figure in helping the believers in Colossae come to hear and learn about the gospel. Paul here refers to him as being one of you. It appears that he was from that very same city that Paul now writes to. He had served among them. He had prayed with them, shared meals with them. He had become family with the believers at Colossae. It is interesting, though, that the scriptures connect Epaphras to his church and to his God. There are many things that you and I can connect with as our accolades. But when, we, when we listen to, the, to what Paul says here about Epaphras, it is very insightful that he connects Epaphras with his church and with his God. He says, he is one of you. Identifying him with the city and the local church. But he is also identified as a servant of God. Of all the things which could be said about him, it is this connection to the church and God which appears most important. What is most important about us is that we are part of the family of God and servants of God. Somebody praise the Lord. Amen. We are part of the family of God and we are servants of Christ. We don't need the degrees. We don't need the accolades. We don't need the prestigious names. What we need most is that we are members of the family of God. We are servants of Christ. Amen. I want you this morning to think of yourself as a professor and the believers here at, here at Stanton, the church family, as the, letter, as, as the ones to whom this letter is written. I invite you to walk for a day in his shoes and to follow the example that he has set for us that the Holy Spirit commends in this greeting. We can learn some simple yet profound lessons about strengthening the Christian community from what Paul says here. First of all, we strengthen Christian community by remembering believers. Epaphras, remember the believers while away from them. We're not sure exactly where he is. He, is. he may be with Paul in Rome or in Ephesus during one of his imprisonments. But what we know for sure is that Epaphras is away from his home church. But he did not allow physical distance to get in the way of his connection with the church. He had a heart for them. The church remained very much in his thoughts. And as we will see in a while, his prayers. He remembered them. He 
remembered the believers. He remembered the family of God. The idea of remembering is important in the New Testament. Listen to some scriptures on remembering. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my imprisonment. Colossians 4.18 Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. 1 Corinthians 11.2 I do not cease to give thanks for you. Here it is again. Remembering you in my prayers. Ephesians 1.16 I thank my God in all remembrance of you. Philippians 1.3 Without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day. 2 Timothy 1.3 Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Hebrews 13.3 No one wants to feel forgotten. An old couple, Agnes and Fred, had trouble remembering anything. During a checkup, the doctor tells the couple they are okay physically, but should re repeat everything to one another to help them remember things. Fred says to Agnes, Agnes, would you like whipped cream on your ice cream? Yes, Fred, I would like whipped cream on my ice cream. Would you like peanuts on the whipped cream on your ice cream? Yes, I would like peanuts on the whipped cream on my ice cream. Would you like a cherry on the peanuts on the whipped cream on your ice cream? Yes, I would like a cherry on the peanuts on the whipped cream on my ice cream. About five minutes later, Fred presents Agnes with a piping hot plate of scrambled eggs. <laughs> Agnes protests, oh my goodness, you forgot my toast. <laughs> they, they had both forgotten despite the repetition. Epaphras remembered his brothers and sisters. We can strengthen the church by remembering each other. There may be brothers and sisters who may not be here today, but we remember them. While you're at the kitchen sink washing the dishes, you remember the brothers and sisters. While you are doing the laundry, the Holy Spirit puts on your heart in your remembrance someone helping you to remember we need to remember each other. That's the beginning point of strengthening the Christian community in the midst of this trying time. The Christ building Christian community, strengthening Christian community does not end with remembering, but we strengthen Christian community by praying faithfully and purposefully for the believers. Epaphras prayed faithfully and purposefully for the believers at Colossae that they would stand perfect in Christ and fully assured of all of God's will for their lives. We must pray faithfully for our dear brothers and sisters. What's in view here? Epaphras' action in prayer has been varyly translated Epaphras is described by the CSB as contending, struggling, ESV, laboring fervently, New King James Version, wrestling, NIV, NRSV. The Greek word agonizomai may mean to engage in an athletic contest or carry the idea of a fight or struggle. The idea of striving is also present. The same word, form, is used earlier in the book, in chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. And we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. 
And for this purpose, I also labor, striving according to the power which mightily works within me. The picture here is of a woman in labor, pushing to bring a child into this world. Biblical scholar Craig Keener says Paul thus depicts prayer as a form of spiritual conflict or discipline crucial to their mission. Wrestling prayer is a prayer that engages the mind, engages the heart, and engages the energy of Christ, which is at work powerfully within each and every one of us as believers. We see an example of this kind of wrestling prayer in the life of Jesus. We are told in Luke 22, 44, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground because of you, because of me, because you are valuable to him. He prayed the price and he prayed until his sweat drops of blood. That's agonizing prayer. And that's the prayer we see Epaphras praying for the believers. Agonizing prayer. And so we build Christian community by praying this kind of wrestling prayer but we also do so by doing so regularly. Look at that little very small word there. He says he is always. This is not a one-time thing, but this is an ongoing prayer, an ongoing wrestling, an ongoing spiritual warfare, an ongoing battle which he is fighting for the believers because he want, he has a vision, he has a mission in mind. You will notice that the verse only speaks about the how of prayer, that we should pray regularly, that we should pray fervently, but the verse also talks about the why of prayer or the purpose of our prayers. The purpose of our prayers is Christian maturity. When we pray, when we pray for each other, I think I'm missing a slide there, sorry. When we pray for each other, we do so purposefully. We do so with, 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 with God's kingdom and God's will in mind. This is more than just God bless me prayer. Bless me prayer. But this is a prayer that God fill us with the knowledge of your will. Lord, I pray that you'll minister with power and might for the believers. I pray that believers be formed in the character of Christ. I pray God that believers would surrender their lives completely and totally to live their lives for you and for you alone. Organizing prayer that is done purposefully. He prays that they would stand perfect and they would stand fully assured of God's will. Some of you have an experience of growing a tomato tree or plant. I'm sure Chris has grown tomato plants before. And if you know anything about growing tomatoes, if you leave a tomato to itself, it soon falls to the ground when, you when the fruit begins to grow and it gets too heavy for the plant. You don't grow a tomato plant just for it to look green. You grow it, the plant so you can harvest the tomatoes. You have a vision in mind. You have a purpose in mind. But if you know if the to tomato plant is left without it being sticked, without it getting the support it needs, the plant rests on the ground, and the red fruit, if left out too long, will rot. Our prayers is like that stick that props up the believer and holds up each person that as we bear fruit, our fruit does not stay in the ground and rot because we have our brothers and our sisters who are holding us up in prayer. We are being propped up by prayer. Isn't that wonderful? 
That's wonderful. We build Christian community by remembering each other. But we build it by praying faithfully and purposefully for each other. But we see something very special there. Prayer serves as a sacred space where heaven and earth meet together. It is a place where the Lord opens our eyes and our hearts to see and feel the needs of others. It is there the Holy Spirit breathes on us, making us willing vessels in the service of others. It is a place where the mission of the church is energized. We need to get and stay in that place of prayer. And finally, I hope I'm doing good if time. <laughs> Remembering occurs in our personal space. Prayer connects us to God in a human divine relationship. But connecting all the, with all the believers completes the triune relationship in which the believer not only connects with God, but connects also with other fellow brothers and sisters. Epaphras sends greetings to the believers while physically separated from them. But he doesn't. He, he goes on to, to, he remembers them in faithful prayers. But he also lets them know it. That's where the connecting is. He remembers them. He travels in prayer for them. But he lets them know it. That's what connecting is all about. We build strong community. We strengthen strong community by connecting with each other. Connecting. Jesus at the center but our lives are intermingled. Our lives are intertwined. We are all one in Christ. We are all together in his journey together. We know each other's needs. We know each other's fears. We know each other's struggles. And we are right there with our brothers and sisters in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their, sh of their, their difficulties. We are right there together as brothers and sisters. Last week, my daughter sat at a table for, after church and she said the words, I love church. At the age of two. I'm sure... As wonderful as Pastor Steve's sermon was, and she wouldn't have heard that, as wonderful as the singing was, it is this connecting, that connecting, where she was able to connect with the other children in the church that gave her this feeling, wow, church is a wonderful place. I love church. One of my friends is also preaching this morning. And during the week, we exchange a few text messages. He says, Zyphus, I'll be praying for you. He said, I'll be praying for you as well. This morning, he sent a text message. Zyphus, I've been praying for you. You'll do well. He said, amen, my brother. I've also been praying for you. That's connecting. During the week, I had the privilege of having a video call with one of my friends, pastor friends there in Nepal. We were able to share with each other and pray for one another. That's connecting. Yesterday, we were here at, at the, the men's prayer breakfast and men were here sharing with each other. I wish the ladies and our children would have that kind of connecting as well. You could see that men pouring out their hearts, having to cry if they need to cry, sharing their stories, and carrying each other's load. That is connecting. 
So how does that look? If we are going to apply this, and I want to throw a challenge to us as we think about this. This church, I want to say, is doing a fantastic job where connecting is concerned. But I believe that God wants us to do so even more and more. No person should live here on a Sunday morning and go to their homes for an entire week and not hear or connect with a believer throughout for, for, for several days and then come back the following Sunday. I don't think this should happen. What is a text? What is a phone call? Now we can visit as we would like to. But I believe there's some kind of connecting that we can do that will allow us to journey through this challenging season. And so I want to leave you with three applications, and then I close. The first one is that we should pray for the believers in your private time, and let them know that you're doing it. This week, God is going to bring to your mind, to your remembrance, persons from the fellowship. When they come to mind, it may just be a single line prayer, utter a, a word of prayer on their behalf. And maybe you will just send a message and say, my brother, I'm praying for you. Dennis, I'm praying for you. Micah, I'm praying for you. Tim, I'm praying for you. You would imagine how special that would make them feel. And I want to let us know that this is not just the job of the pastor and the elders. This is what we do for each other as a family of God. Yeah. So imagine this week we would all say, you know what, I will leave this place. And I will ensure that during the course of this week, I will at least make contact with three persons. Three persons, three persons, three persons, three persons. No one here would come back next Sunday and say, I did not connect in a meaningful way with my brothers and sisters during the week. Pray for believers in your private time. Let them know you're doing it. But also we can use various, technological, various tools of technology to stay in touch, to show care, pray, and connect at a deeper personal level. We might not be able to do our small group meetings as we've, we've customarily done, but we can stay in touch. This past week, I tried something. During my prayer time, I said, God, I would love my children to spend more time reading the Bible. And last week, as we spoke, Pastor Steve, we talked about the thing that children spend the most time doing. They spend hours upon hours on screens. I said to myself, I think my best bet to get my children reading the Bible is to get them reading it on a screen. And so, I got this version Bible app. And we found a four-day Bible plan. We said, we're gonna, I said, we're going to begin with a very short plan. Nothing too hard, nothing too difficult. Very four-day Bible reading plan. And we all got onto it. My wife and I got onto it, and the children got onto it. And as you read each day, each day, there is a devotional, and there is a set of scripture readings. And when you finished it, it shows a tick beside your name, beside a person's name. So I can know when Zachary hasn't finished his reading. <laughs> and they can see who's finished. And there's, there's also a place where we can leave comments for after the day's devotional. That's just a beginning point. Just imagine if I could get Amina and some of the other children together. These young men will be even more motivated to read. Because now it's not just mom and dad. Now it's all my friends at church. But it allows them to connect. It allows them to remain in touch. It allows them to journey in the word of God together, even in the midst of physical distancing. We can do this. Some of us have difficulty with the social media because we've, we're old school. But guess what? Nothing beats the old time 
phone call. <laughs> now we, we, we send text messages and we, we, we do, we, for, for us in the Caribbean, we do video calls and, 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 and audio calls using WhatsApp. But a good old fashioned phone call still works. This morning we heard about the, the, the prayer chain. That's, that's, these, are, these are all the kinds of opportunities we must continue to use to remain connected. But I believe that God will have us to break new ground. Because we have so many young persons who are in the instant messaging age. They don't have time to check email. They are on Instagram. They are on Facebook. They are on TikTok. Help me now, boys. <laughs> and we may have to try to find new ways of bringing them in and connecting them that they too feel like part of the family of God. The strength of the church is seen in the strengths of the relationships in the church and the connection of the fellowship to God demonstrated in its life of prayer and worship. Despite the challenges of social and physical distancing, I'm landing this plane right now, don't worry. We can strengthen the community of faith by remembering the household of God. Faithfully praying for believers and meaningfully engaging the church. By remembering, praying for, and engaging the household of faith, we foster strong bonds that serve to strengthen and unify the faith community. We are stronger together, not separated. We are stronger together, not isolated. We are stronger together, remembering each other. We are stronger together, praying for one another. We are stronger together, engaging, connecting, contacting one another. May God bless you.